Friday, 12th of May, 2017. St Bartholomew's Hospital, Central London. It's 10 a.m. and Patrick Ward is finding it hard to concentrate on the trashy crime novel he's reading. Patrick is 47 years old. He's hours away from the surgery that he hopes will change his life. It took him a while to get to this point. It all started a few years ago. I was playing football and noticed the shortness of breath and I just thought it was some sort of pain in my uh, throat and then I went back to the doctor and he told me to stop everything. Turns out Patrick had an enlarged heart. It's a hereditary condition which meant his heart struggled to pump enough blood through his body. He'd been an active guy but now he had to take breaks just to walk up a flight of stairs. Doctors eventually offer a solution but it's a highly risky one, open heart surgery. Yeah, it was a major, major decision. It's also a very specialised operation and not many surgeons in the UK carry it out. So Patrick has to wait, two years in fact, but eventually, in May 2017, it's his turn. I was um, mentally prepared to have many, many weeks off work, to have my chest cut open, and I wanted it at that point. I was going to get my, my life back again. So on that Friday, when the surgeon drops by to check on him mid-morning, he's feeling pretty upbeat. How are you feeling? I said, yeah, fine, relax. And then he came again at 12 o'clock and said, it won't be long now, Pat. And then, after 1 p.m., just minutes before his surgery is due to begin, he notices... A little bit of commotion outside the room that I was in. So I then got up out of the bed and walked out to the nurse's station just to see blank monitors everywhere. Oh, really? So all the machines were switched, well, the screens were sort of... Black. And obviously people looking very worried and nurses and, and orderlies and various other people just wandering around the place, not quite knowing what to do. Across London, in another hospital run by the UK's National Health Service, the NHS, a similar scene is taking place. Tony Bleakman is a consultant in emergency medicine and he's just arrived for his shift at the Accident and Emergency Unit. And as I walked into the office, it became clear that uh, something had gone drastically wrong with all the computers in the office. Uh, there was a, a message on the screen, on everybody's computer screen. Against a red background, the message reads... Oops, your files have been encrypted. Maybe you're busy looking for a way to recover your files. But do not waste your time. Nobody can recover your files without our decryption service. Hackers have broken into the hospital's computer system and scrambled all the data. They're offering to unscramble it, but for a price, several hundred dollars paid in the virtual currency, Bitcoin. If you want to decrypt your files, you need to pay. You only have three days to submit your payment, but you have not so enough time. And there's an extra twist. After a few days, the ransom money doubles. And if nothing's paid within a week, the hackers say they'll destroy all the data forever. The drop-down menu offers instructions for payment in 28 different languages. It seems the hackers were setting themselves up for international success, but the hospital is in no position to pay the ransom. And so instead, in an attempt to control the outbreak, they switch off the network. We couldn't register new patients on a computer. We couldn't access their medical records. We couldn't track their location what's happening to them and who's looking after them and what their blood results are. We couldn't access X-ray or CT images on the computer. Today's doctors need access to state-of-the-art technology. When time is tight, it can help make quick, accurate, life-saving decisions. Say a patient turns up with symptoms of a stroke. One possibility is that part of the brain is blocked by a clot. Another, that a brain vessel might be bleeding. If you give clot-busting treatment in the first case, you're saving a life. But if it's the second, the consequences are catastrophic and could lead to death. The only way to know for sure is to carry out a brain scan. The same is true for the whole of emergency medicine, from car accidents to cancer. Scanning is an essential frontline asset. But that technology, along with just basic admin IT, is now unavailable to Tony and his colleagues. So they adapt. Non-critical patients get turned away. So if somebody came in with a fracture, we would put on a temporary plaster cast and discharge the patient to come back at a later date to have that fracture managed. And some critical patients are diverted to other hospitals. But that becomes increasingly difficult 
as other hospitals succumb to the virus. At least one of the London trauma centres was not accepting trauma patients because their trauma surgeons were unable to access CT images, which they often rely upon when embarking on emergency surgery. And there was restricted access for a time for heart attack centres. Meanwhile, back at St Bartholomew's Hospital, Patrick is still waiting to be taken to the operating theatre. You then start looking on your phone, you then start trying to get on the television and, and see if you can see things. The NHS is the victim of a major cyber attack. At least 25 hospital trusts and GP surgeries have been affected. They have declared major incidents. Ambulances are being diverted away from it's some places. It's a large-scale and... cyber attack. GPs are using pen and paper and some hospitals are asking people to stay away from... Yeah, it really unless... has caused havoc in... Like real patients are going to suffer. Back, back to the Stone <laughs> Age, isn't it? But it's a type of ransomware bug that has got into the system. System. Pretty now, unprecedented to have a nationwide ransomware attack like this. I don't think we've seen that before. Oh my God, what's going on? For many, many people in the UK, it was suddenly, oh, what's this thing called ransomware? What's, what's a cyber attack? And then his surgeon finally reappears with bad news. The hospital's computer system had been hacked. Their systems were all down. And I said, well, we don't need that, you're operating on my heart. You know, what, what on earth do you need a computer for? Come on, I've waited two years for this operation. This cannot be happening to me now. No, you're joking, I thought he was having a laugh to begin with. But the surgeon's dead serious. I'm really sorry, Pat, but we need the computers for your blood results, we need that for your tests. It's an integral part of the operation. There's nothing we can do. The operation's cancelled, you, you can leave. The whole thing was just very, very, yeah, very surreal. Why choose the NHS? Why paralyse somebody that was doing good? Individuals who, you know, are not part of the global picture, who are just trying to go about their everyday lives and, yeah, get better. The virus would become known as WannaCry. Even among the obscure world of virus names, that's a strange one. Here's how it came about. At the heart of the virus is actually a legitimate piece of software. So if you want to scramble your own files so that no one can read them and you can keep them secure, you can use a thing called Windows Crypto. Once it's done scrambling the files, it puts WinCry, W-I-N-C-R-Y, at the end of the file name. The folks who wrote the virus hitting hospitals and others in 2017 hijacked that legitimate software and turned it nasty. So instead of you scrambling your own files and having the key to unlock them, the hackers scramble your files and charge you for the key to unscramble them. The hackers, it seems, also had a sense of humour. They took the WinCry name and changed it to WannaCry, because that's what you want to do when it hits you. And as the worm spreads around the world, it infects the German railway firm Deutsche Bahn. Sparebank in Russia. The car makers Renault, Nissan and Honda. Universities in China. Police departments in India. Spanish comms firm Telefonica. FedEx. Boeing. In the space of an afternoon, it scrambles the data on nearly 250,000 computers around the world and inflicts between 4 billion and 8 billion US dollars in damage. It was the thing people in cybersecurity had dreaded for years, a worldwide cyber pandemic that spreads automatically and seems unstoppable. But it wasn't. Someone brought one cry to a screeching halt the story of who and how is perhaps the weirdest thing in this entire podcast. But stopping the virus doesn't bring the story to an end. It'll go on to embroil the highest levels of US intelligence and set North Korea's hackers on a whole new trajectory. From the BBC World Service, this is The Lazarus Heist. I'm Jeff White. I'm Jean Lee. Episode 10, Kill Switch. The 12th of May, the day that WannaCry struck, was supposed to be a day off for Marcus Hutchins. He's a wholesome looking guy with a winning smile and a big mass of curly hair. At this point, he's 22 years old. He's already getting a six figure salary as a researcher for an American cyber intelligence company. He's working on viruses, or malware, as they call it in the trade. Tracking cybercrime gangs that use malware and uh, tracking the malware that they're distributing. So this was stuff I just taught myself because it seemed cool. Because these are obviously criminal operations. They don't necessarily want people snooping inside them. 
but you often come across some where you can actually see a little window into what they're doing, and it's, it's fascinating. He was a precocious computer whiz. As a kid, he annoyed his father by dismantling the family PC. He filled it with strange programs, and on his 13th birthday, his parents agreed to buy him his own computer. From that point onward, there was no turning back. Marcus refines his programming skills for hours on end, immersing himself in the world of hacking. At 17, he starts a blog called Malware Tech. His posts become famous for their detailed breakdowns of computer nasties. By now, he's accumulated hundreds of thousands of followers, but they have no idea of his real name or even what his life is like. And that's because the profile photo on his blog just shows a pouty-faced cat wearing enormous sunglasses. There's this cliche about hackers being teenage boys working from their bedrooms, except in Marcus's case, it's not a cliche. I was still living with my parents. I just had this, this bedroom in my parents' house where I had this computer set up and this server rack. This is in a sleepy seaside town in the southwest of England. It's a few minutes from the beach where Marcus goes surfing. It's called Ilfracombe. I've actually been there on a holiday years ago. It's a quaint little place with little twisty roads and ice cream shops on the beach. It is frankly not the kind of place you'd expect to find world-leading computer experts. Marcus's own family have no idea what he's up to in his bedroom, except that it's vaguely connected to computers. I've always been quite a reserved private person, so I kept my job side of my life very separate from my personal life. I didn't really share a lot of what I do with my parents or my friends or my family. So on Friday the 12th, Marcus starts the day by taking it easy. He goes to grab some lunch at a local fish and ship shop, but when he comes back and sits down in front of his computer, he discovers that the internet is basically on fire. So now there's NHS hospitals all across the UK reporting they've been hit by the same malware. So that was the point where I'm like, this is something serious. He immediately contacts a cybersecurity friend and asks for a sample of the virus. Hey, have you heard about this WannaCry thing? I'm looking for a copy of it. He just gave me one the second that I asked. He quickly spots something that makes WannaCry different to other viruses and much, much more dangerous. Remember how in the Sony hack and the Bangladesh bank heist, the hackers tricked people into clicking on dodgy emails and downloading the virus? Well, there's no need for that with WannaCry. WannaCry was the first ransomware to ever spread computer to computer, which meant you didn't have to open a malicious email or click a strange link. It was just able to hack your computer remotely. I mean, this is really terrifying because previously people have always had to you know, click on an email or click on a link. Suddenly you stand a chance of getting hit just by being in the way of this thing. Yeah, it was definitely a huge milestone in really cybercrime in general. This is the first worm to ever actually have like an insanely high impact on the infected machine. Like essentially all their files would be encrypted. They would lose all of their data the second they were hit. Marcus isn't quite right there. There have been other destructive auto-spreading viruses, but not for a long while and nowhere near as disruptive as WannaCry. In our modern world of interconnected tech, the virus was out of control, spreading indiscriminately. People had assumed that they were going after the NHS, but seeing all this data, it was clear that this was not targeted to the NHS. It was not even targeted to the UK. This was just hitting anything everywhere in the world. It was phenomenal scale. It was nothing I've ever seen before. It was just infections coming in in the thousands per like a few seconds. I was just completely shocked by the rate in which it was spreading. It was overwhelming. The 12th of May 2017 is a, is a day that um, uh, I'll probably never forget if I'm honest. Mike Hewlett works for the UK's National Cybercrime Unit. And back in 2017, he's the head of operations responsible for investigations into all serious cyber attacks in the UK. It becomes pretty rapidly apparent around lunchtime on that day that this is not just an isolated um, incident affecting uh, one hospital or one organisation. This appears to be something that uh, was going to warrant the full attention of the National Cybercrime Unit. Mike and his team quickly identify how WannaCry is spreading. When the the virus hit one particular computer, it exploited a, a port on the systems uh, known as port 445. That is an internal port within computers, but it allows um, different computers on the same network to communicate with each other. And so by necessity, it's open. And some of those that are public facing, that's how the virus managed to propagate itself so quickly across the world. So the more connected the organisation is, the easier for the malware to spread. 
and this means that while it might not have been the intended target, the NHS, as one of the world's largest employers, becomes one of the hardest hit. There's over a million people in the NHS that have got a dot .NHS email address and the ability to connect across the country so that you know, results and tests and so on can be uh, sent quickly around the country from institution to institution means that you've got a quite widely interconnected system, particularly susceptible to, uh, to infection. Meanwhile, in his bedroom, Marcus is still dissecting the WannaCry code and he spots something unusual before infecting a victim the virus would try to visit a particular website that had a long, seemingly random address. If the virus found the website was up and running, it would stop, leaving the victim's files untouched. But if the website wasn't responding, the virus would kick in, scrambling the files, demanding a ransom, and trying to infect other machines. So Marcus has the idea of checking who actually owns the website, or the domain to give it the technical name, that the virus is trying to visit. I immediately saw the domain and I was like, huh, I'll, uh, I'll go query that, see who owns it. And nobody owned it, so I, I immediately just registered it. By taking control of the website, Marcus in fact brings the outbreak to a halt. The virus code sees that the site is up and running, and so it stops, no longer infecting any computers or trying to spread itself. But Marcus doesn't immediately realise what he's done. At first we were looking into the data, how it was spreading, and we were trying to find a way to fight it. Later in the day, someone pointed out this code and I thought, wow, like, we don't actually need to do anything. And so you started to see the virus sort of petering to a halt, WannaCry petering to a halt? Yeah, so uh, within seconds of registering the domains, the infection rate just started declining. Just like that, only a few hours after the WannaCry virus hit the UK, Marcus had found the kill switch and activated it. I say ultimately there were something like 150,000 um, computers worldwide that were affected, but there were probably millions more which were vulnerable. But uh, when attempts were made by the malware to infect them, uh, that computer would call out to this domain and it wouldn't go any further. So it had the effect of stopping the attack in its tracks. So the authors of the virus built in a really easy off switch and left it open to the world. Now, why would they do that? It's a very good question, and obviously, unfortunately, we don't have the writer of the virus here with us to ask uh, him or her, but one of the theories is this. If you're testing these computer viruses in a lab, you've got to be careful about the virus accidentally breaking out and infecting your own company's computers. So one of the things researchers will do is to build in this kind of kill switch, a sort of easy off mechanism that they can use if the thing escapes from their control. Now, usually before you release the virus into the wild, you'd take that kill switch out or you'd protect it so it's not easily triggered. But it seems in this case, WannaCry was released with the kill switch still there. It's one of the indications researchers have pointed to to say that WannaCry looks a bit like something that was half-baked, something that was released out into the world too early. But look, for Marcus, this was an unexpected windfall. Usually stopping malware is this huge feat where you're fighting for weeks or months, battling the guys on the other end. You're coming up with clever ways to dismantle their infrastructure. I'd never come across something so easy, and it was just like, wow, it's just stopped. Simply registering the domain was enough to stop it. How much did you have to pay to register it? Something like £9 or $12 at the time. Marcus just stopped one of the world's most dangerous virus outbreaks, and all for the price of a large fish and chips. And he may feel it was almost too easy, but that doesn't stop him from becoming famous overnight. The global cyber attack was halted almost by accident. It was a 22-year-old in the UK who checked the code and found a reference to an unregistered... Soon, the British tabloids find out his identity and run headlines about the accidental hero who saved the world from his bedroom. And they had my name, they had a photo of me they'd found on someone's Twitter feed. And at that point, they were camping out on my lawn outside the front gate of my house. How did that feel to suddenly be um, in, in the full glare of it? Uh, it was horrifying. I'm, I was never really a fan of the idea of fame. I never wanted it. And suddenly now everyone who's been following my blog knows who I am and uh, anyone reading the world's media, which was just terrifying. He gives one interview to a reporter at the news agency Associated Press, and he's so frazzled that he misspells his last name. But that wire story goes around the world and turns him into a celebrity. Marcus may dread the spotlight, but his newfound fame does come with some perks. He gets thousands more social media followers. A local restaurant offers him free pizza for a year. 
and perhaps most importantly his family, including his mum, who's an NHS nurse, finally understand what he does for a living. The WannaCry attack is over, but the damage is done. Marcus may have stopped the virus, but the victims whose data has been scrambled, they don't get that data back. The impact is particularly severe within the NHS. In England, for example, a third of the groups that run the NHS's hospitals were either infected or had to disconnect computers to protect themselves. Almost 7,000 appointments had to be cancelled, including more than 100 urgent cancer cases. NHS staff I spoke to told me they were working extra hours to rebuild their systems and get patients' appointments back on track. Including Patrick Ward's. A couple of months later, he gets that operation, which, as he had hoped, gives him his health back. But for Mike Hewlett and his colleagues at the National Crime Agency's cyber unit, the real work's just begun. Very often what we find with cyber cases is the incident itself, it's over quite quickly. What always takes longer though is the investigation that goes into it. So clearly what we've got here, we've got one of the, the most destructive and impactive cyber attacks that we've seen for many years in the UK. And uh, it's our job to try and identify and bring whoever's responsible for this to justice. And so begins the task of finding out not only who did it, but also the motive. Were they after the money or was it something else? And for Marcus, his story isn't over. He's been hiding a secret all the way along, something that will cast a long shadow over his heroic acts. At first, WannaCry looked like a typical piece of ransomware. When police investigate these attacks, they can sometimes use the same tactic used in kidnapping, get into direct negotiation with the extortionists and try and track them down. In some past ransomware instances, the police were able to contact the crooks and even on occasion managed to pinpoint their exact location and make an arrest. We've become acutely aware of this here in the United States. We had a recent ransomware attack that paralyzed the delivery of gasoline up and down the East Coast. Amazingly, after a ransom was paid, the FBI was able to claw back millions of the ransom. But Mike Hewlett, of the UK's National Crime Agency had no such luck with WannaCry. And that's because whoever unleashed WannaCry appears to have had no interest in helping their victims pay the ransom and recover their data. If you pay the ransom, do you get your files back? Uh, unfortunately not. And to my knowledge, there wasn't any cases around the world where someone had successfully paid the amount and uh, received a decryption key in return. It turns out the WannaCry hackers made very little money out of the attack. With WannaCry, what was odd though is the demand was really, really low, considering the destructive um, effect that it had. There was something like $160,000, I think, worldwide was paid in chunks of $300 for ransom payments. Personally, I suspect the vast majority of that was law enforcement agencies or cybersecurity researchers uh, you know, paying their money and just seeing what would happen. So WannaCry made $160,000. Just to put that in context, a few years back I covered a different strain of ransomware which in just a few months made $350 million. The WannaCry hackers had created the world's most effective ransomware and didn't even make enough to buy a Lamborghini. So you, yeah, you've got a ransomware campaign where the, the people doing it don't seem interested in getting the ransom. That must have rung, rung alarm bells. It did, so you then start to question, well, what are the motives? Sometimes the, the motivation is more destructive. Um, it is around uh, just effectively denying service or, or taking a service offline for whatever other reason. But in this case, you've got something which, which appears to be on the face of it, a financially motivated crime, but um, no real way of actually making money out of it. There's one obvious theory, that it's not a cybercrime gang, but a nation state. And there are suspicions, even at this stage, that the Lazarus Group is behind WannaCry. Some believe the real goal of WannaCry was to create chaos, disrupt our lives, destroy our sense of well-being. It was a display, they say, of state power by North Korea. So the British take their findings to their American counterparts, and at this point, the FBI in Los Angeles is still working on the attacks on Sony Pictures Entertainment and the Bangladesh Bank. We've got the FBI looking at Sony back in 2014, and we've got the UK looking at WannaCry in 2017. We're working back in time, and they're working slightly forward in time. And ultimately, what we're trying to do is to build a chain that goes from one to the other and the British investigators find a vital link in that chain. It turns out the version of WannaCry that hit in May 2017 was just the latest iteration. There'd been at least two previous versions with very similar code suggesting the same author or team was behind all three campaigns. And sure enough, as they analyse some of those earlier versions of WannaCry, 
the investigators find a clue. Hidden within the code is a chart full of data that helps the hackers remotely control their viruses. It's their own way of communicating between victim machines and, and the hackers who are sort of controlling them and sending them commands. That's Tony Lewis. He was assistant US attorney for the Central District of California back then. And ever since the Sony hack back in 2014, he'd been helping the FBI assemble a case against the hackers. As British police investigate WannaCry, he starts to see the links. So once that data table was discovered, it was searched for in other malware. And lo and behold, we found it in a malware found at Sony Pictures, malware found at other financial institutions that were victims of these same actors. You saw it coming, didn't you? That's right. Both the US and British authorities conclude that the Lazarus Group, the hacking ring they say North Korea sponsors, was also behind the WannaCry attack. Lazarus Group had evolved from hacking a Hollywood studio to tackling a national bank in Bangladesh, and now unleashing a global virus pandemic using cutting edge cryptocurrency. North Korea denies all this, and through a spokesperson, describes the accusations as, quote, a grave political provocation by the US aimed at inducing the international society into a confrontation against the DPRK by tarnishing the image of the dignified country and demonizing it, end quote. But as the investigators dig into WannaCry, there's something else they find out, something that's going to make this whole situation very uncomfortable for the Americans. The earlier versions of WannaCry weren't particularly good. They had almost no impact. What made that May 2017 version so much more destructive was two new pieces of code called Eternal Blue and Double Pulsar, another couple of weird virus names. But these ones are really important. Previously, the hackers would have to send their viruses to victims, usually by email, and then trick them into opening them, clicking on links, which is what happened at Sony and Bangladesh Bank. Eternal Blue and Double Pulsar do away with that. Eternal Blue automatically spreads the virus from computer to computer, no more having to send out emails, and Double Pulsar automatically triggers the virus when it arrives on a new computer. No need to get your victims to click. This is new, and it's terrifying. In the cybersecurity world, we call this an exploit. It's a piece of software that takes advantage of a bug or a vulnerability. In this case, the Microsoft Windows vulnerability that allowed computers to automatically share files, including viruses. And guess what? These particular exploits weren't created by criminal hackers. It appears they were the work of the US National Security Agency. Governments are going to discover vulnerabilities in software and are going to develop exploits for them. We might not like it, and you know we don't like it when our adversaries do that. Priscilla Moriucci is a cybersecurity researcher. She's a fellow at Harvard. But before that, she spent 12 years with the National Security Agency, and she explains that the U.S. government routinely develops its own cyber weapons, but that they have procedures in place to keep them as safe as they can. So basically, if the U.S. government finds a problem with computers or flooring computers, they can use that floor for a bit to get to stage attacks, but they eventually have to sort of say, look, this is what we, what we found. Feel free to go ahead and fix it. Yeah, so they have to make an assessment, right, when they discover a vulnerability and are able to develop an exploit for it. So they have to go through a process right across, you know, the intelligence community and the military where different agencies get to weigh in and say, like, hey, it's not worth it, right, to keep this from the public or it is worth it. This is murky territory. If the world was a lovely, fluffy place, then as soon as a government found out about a tech vulnerability, they'd share that information with everyone so we could all be protected. But the world isn't like that, is it? Government hackers actively hunt for these vulnerabilities. And when they create an exploit for them, they regard those exploits as weapons, tools they can use to break into other government systems. Making your opponents aware of your exploits blunts their effectiveness. And who ever heard of a government giving away its weapons? And so, in the case of the Eternal Blue exploit, it appears that the NSA knew about the Microsoft vulnerability as early as 2012 but they held on to it for more than five years. Then something remarkable happened. A group of hackers called the Shadow Brokers, who some say are connected to the Russian state, managed to steal this deadly piece of software and they put it up for auction. Ultimately, the auction didn't work. So earlier on in April 2017, the exploit was released into the wild. 
So they, they just gave it away, this yeah, cyber tool? Yeah, they gave it away, yeah, yeah. And so it was there to be used by anybody. I'm trying to think of a good real-world analogy uh, for this, and it's a bit like turning up to a sort of backstreet arms market bazaar where people are selling handguns and petrol bombs, and you turn up with free armoured personnel carriers and give them away. Suddenly the Americans were seeing this super advanced cyber weapon being harnessed by their enemies and unleashed worldwide. By early 2017, Microsoft had been warned about the vulnerability and had issued an update to fix it. But the update wasn't automatic or compulsory, so millions of computers remained unpatched and therefore vulnerable when the Lazarus Group unleashed its new version of the ransomware. You've got the same reasonably crude bit of ransomware attached to effectively a weapons grade exploit, you know, something that was originally designed by the NSA for whatever purpose the NSA needed it for. But this is now something which is being weaponized and used against countries all over the world. So uh, a certain irony there, um, uh, one, one would say, and uh, part of the reason why the FBI and uh, other US agencies were, were so keen to put uh, a lot of resource into finding out uh, who was responsible. By the summer of 2017, British authorities make it known that they believe North Korea was behind the WannaCry attack. News you would have thought would worry Marcus Hutchins. The people whose party he spoiled are believed to work for a regime that's been accused of kidnapping and murdering people, even outside its own borders. They could have retaliated, but by the time I actually found out, I was kind of numb to the feeling. I had just been arrested by the US government, so I had bigger problems at the time. So we need to rewind slightly here. In August 2017, after probably the most intense few months of his life, Marcus flies to Las Vegas to attend DEF CON. That's the world's largest annual hacking conference. And there, he's treated like a celebrity. DEF CON is kind of a legendary event. It goes back years. It's where hackers hang out. Hackers of all stripes, some of them murkier than others. And of course, law enforcement gets interested in this, and so they start sending undercover officers in to see what they can find out. Uh, and then DEF CON actually launches a competition called Spot the Fed, where attendees try and spot who's the federal agent in the audience. Uh, and if you win, you get a T-shirt with I spotted the Fed. And I think the victim, the Fed, gets a T-shirt saying I am the Fed. By the way, if you go to DEF CON in Las Vegas, don't connect to any Wi-Fi networks. It's full of hackers trying to steal your information. Anyway, this is where Marcus found himself in August 2017, and he would have been right at home. I usually don't vacation very much, so this is my once a year vacation where I just, I just, I guess, let out all of the energy that's been built up for so many months. And presumably at this point as well, the people at the conference must have known all, all, all about what you'd done. Presumably you, you got a really good reception, I'd imagine. What was it like? Yeah, it was weird. I had a lot of people approaching me for photos and even some people asking for autographs. Like it was more attention than I'd ever gotten in my life and I just, I was somewhat uncomfortable with it. We had booked this mansion quite far from the Vegas Strip. So I kind of ended up just hiding in the mansion and partying for most of the holiday. We got to do some crazy things. We uh, went to shooting ranges, drove Lamborghinis. We obviously had this nice house to party in. So it was, it felt like the holiday of a lifetime until I got to the airport. And then that's, that's when things went south. Having hardly slept, and let's face it, probably still a bit drunk from the partying, Marcus turns up at Las Vegas airport. When I got to the lounge to board my flight, they picked me up there. It was very much a tap on the shoulder, hey, are you Marcus Hutchins? To which I obviously answered yes. At first, Marcus assumes they want to ask him about his role in stopping the WannaCry attack. But he's interrogated for an hour and a half, and he realizes this is about something else. When I was a lot younger, I used my skills for some less than good things. I, uh, I got involved in some criminal hacking. When Marcus first discovered the world of malware and hackers as a teenager, he'd actually started writing some of it himself. He became pretty good at it, and someone eventually approached him with an offer. So I was basically a contract programmer for a guy who, he essentially just sells malware on the internet. I wrote some malware and this other person wrote some code to steal money from banks, and that got combined with my malware to make malware that steals money from banks. But you got paid for the bit that you did by this person, is that right? Yeah, so I got paid for the bit of code I wrote, even though it was never really my intention to do anything to do with bank fraud or, or stealing money. 
I kind of really screwed up, like I partnered with someone I shouldn't have, I got in way too deep. From that moment on, Marcus knew his fate was sealed. That was kind of the minute where I just knew that at some point in my life I was going to prison. Really? I knew that this was coming. But you know, look, you you did write this malicious software, and as I understand it, it was used, you know, by hackers to break into people's bank accounts and steal, steal money from them, so... You know, to what extent do you feel a responsibility for that? Because you wrote the stuff. Oh yeah, like that was the reason I um, confessed and I ended up pleading guilty. A British-based cybersecurity researcher praised for helping to stop a global attack earlier this year has been arrested and charged in the United States over an unrelated hacking case. Marcus Hutchins was detained in Las Vegas and has been accused of involvement with malware known as Kronos, which stole online banking details and credit card data in 2014 and 2015. So I, I spent like a night in jail and a week or two in prison. But that must have been a heck of a night's sleep to have, to just be sort of staring at the ceiling and thinking of the turn of events. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't really sleep, because uh, these, these county jails, I basically just found myself in a concrete box lying on this hard floor. Wow, so one day you're, you're you know, racing Lamborghinis around the US and being photographed by people as a hero, and the next minute you're in county jail. That must have been a... Yeah, life comes at you fast. He's released after the cybersecurity community reportedly came to his rescue by putting up the bail. The judge allows him to live in Los Angeles under house arrest while he's awaiting trial. In July 2019, Marcus flies to Wisconsin for his trial in a Milwaukee federal court. And after weighing the importance of Marcus's role in stopping WannaCry, the judge shows some leniency. Instead of 10 years in prison, he sentences Marcus to time served. That means he can go free. And there's a silver lining. Marcus has made a new life for himself in California. I came to LA and I found out that this is the home I never had. I love surfing and it's the, the sea in the winter in LA is as warm as it gets in the summer in the UK. It's been a wild ride for him and I can't help but note what a fine line it's been for him between being cast as a cyber criminal and as a cyber hero, if that judge in Milwaukee hadn't seen the value in his cyber skills, Marcus might be sitting in jail instead of surfing into the sunset. The overnight hero was once a cyber crook, arguably not that different to the hackers Marcus was helping to stop just a few months before. Every country has their hackers and every country tells their hackers that they're doing the right thing for their country. But uh, often it can be you're doing catastrophic things that harm or kill people around the world. And obviously the other part is the weapons were stolen from the NSA by what likely is another government that was neither the US nor North Korea. So you've just basically got all these governments hacking each other and fighting among themselves. Uh, and just everyone ended up getting caught in the middle in that. Governments hacking each other and everyone ending up caught in the middle of that. Marcus has neatly summed up our whole podcast there. The fact is, in many parts of the world, our lives are becoming more and more connected thanks to technology. And the beauty of technology is just how seamlessly it puts information at our fingertips. But that very advancement also makes us more vulnerable. Like you, the person listening to this podcast, you've obviously got an internet connection. That almost certainly means you get emails, some of them with dodgy links you might click on without thinking, just like those employees at Sony and Bangladesh Bank. The WannaCry attack helped wake up many people in Britain and elsewhere to this vulnerability. But I have to say, I was very aware of this when I was living in South Korea. This is a country that is celebrated as one of the most wired, most connected countries in the world. South Korea has been the target of North Korean cyber attacks for years, far longer than the United States, the UK, or any of the 150 countries hit by WannaCry. It's a society that runs on smart technology, I mean, I can't remember the last time I saw someone open a door with something as old-fashioned as a key. In fact, the wealthier and more connected you get, the more vulnerable you are. It's what they call in the defense trade, asymmetric threat. The little guy can take on a much bigger adversary and win. And in the case of North Korea, cyber is becoming a dangerous weapon used in asymmetric warfare against its Korean War adversaries. Marcus Garlaskis, the former U.S. National Intelligence Officer from North Korea has this warning for all of us. Just because 
there's not another big headline about a Sony hack or one of these high profile heists that makes the headlines, it doesn't mean that North Korea is not conducting a lot of activity. Certainly, they've invested a lot of resources, they developed their techniques. So if you're not seeing the headlines about North Korean activity, it means that they're probably more effective actually in evading detection. But there is going to be another major attack. It's just a matter of time. There's going to be another major attack. It's just a matter of time. Like its namesake, the Lazarus Group just keeps on springing back to life. The story of the Lazarus Group is far from over. The Lazarus Heist will return with more episodes later in 2021. Imagine if, instead of just hacking into a bank, they could take over its internal systems, including the ones that control the ATMs. Now, they don't need to move money around the world digitally, they can get their hands on cold, hard cash instead. It's a remarkable crime on a truly global scale. Investigators say the Lazarus Group targeted ATMs in 29 different countries. They made 12,000 withdrawals. Totaling 11 million US dollars. And it all happened in just over two hours. That's next time on The Lazarus Heist. Lazarus Heist is an original podcast from the BBC World Service. I'm Jeff White. And I'm Jean Lee. Thanks to all of our listeners for your massive support. The ratings and reviews that you've left really meant a lot to us. Please do carry on leaving those ratings and reviews where podcast apps allow you to and talking about the show on social media. It really helps us get the word out. We're using the hashtag Lazarus Heist. Most of all, please tell everyone you know, your friends, your family and especially those who've never listened to a podcast. Show them how to find a podcast and show them how to find The Lazarus Heist. And there's now a long read on the BBC News website that takes you through the background to some of the stories you've been hearing about in this podcast. There are some great images too. Do please check it out. And remember to subscribe or follow us so that when we return with the next episodes, you'll be sure not to miss them. Thanks for listening.